Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas, and our continuing study in the Church Dogmatics by Carl Bart. We are in uh, Volume 4, uh, which has uh, actually 10 volumes. It's really Part 4, The Doctrine of Reconciliation. And we have uh, just moved into Paragraph 70, which is the uh, Condemnation of Man under the Lordship of Christ as Mediator. So we've been looking at the, the man of sin under the Lordship of Christ as Mediator. We now move into the second lesson within uh, that paragraph 70. We're going to be taking a look at uh, pages 34 to 64, and we're going to address the doctrine of the uh, God-forsakenness on the cross. The doctrine of the uh, God for secondness on the cross. This is a key area where Moltmann, Bart's successor, picked up when he wrote his book, The Crucified God. So it's a, an important lesson. It's only uh, 20 pages, but it's an extremely important lesson on how Professor Bart interprets the doctrine of reconciliation as being founded on the God-forsakenness of Christ on the cross, a forsakenness experienced by the Father and the Son both. And so we're going to take a look at this highly important doctrine as we address the concept of God-forsakenness and understand how that applies to the reconciliation of all creation and the reconciliation of all humanity. So we're going to begin by looking at block one. We're going to look at the positive secret of irrevocable covenant. Uh, the positive secret of irrevocable covenant. Or the concealed aspect of irrevocable covenant. And he goes back to Job and Bart says that Job's grief was a result of falsely transforming the positive secret of his existence. Which is... Uh, the reality of uh, being taken up in an irrevocable covenant. He, re he represents the history of Israel, remember? So uh, he is uh, enclosed within and taken up within an irrevocable covenant. But Job, uh, he will eventually speak in the knowledge of the cause of his affliction because uh, Job's proximity to God is going to be faithful regardless of the good or the ill that might befall him. And he will take up that signification of the true Israel. But there is an incisive change that takes place within this irrevocable covenant in this narrative. God confronts Job in an unrecognizable form, in an unrecognizable way. It's a change which is an incision within the ontological and dynamic relationship between God and Job. So we need to look at this as an incision, as a cut into that uh, aspect of irrevocable covenant. So it is a cut into that uh, irrevocable covenant. And... Uh, Job simply is petitioned for a response of suffering obedience in spite of the good or the will or the form of God which confronts him. He is uh, exhorted or petitioned for an, a response of suffering obedience. And that is better termed, says Bart, as reciprocal free faithfulness between God and Job. And that's the fundamental lesson, lesson being taught here. It's an incision of a partial change within the common covenant history of Job as Israel. Job is confronted by this conflicting kind of strange form of God. But within this conflict, Job does accomplish his repetition of free faithfulness. He does pull through with that uh, free faithfulness. And the wrath of God is only directed toward the friends of falsehood. The friends who uh, represent falsehood, 
And so uh, we learn from this narrative that uh, the word of promise is always in the form of suffering, which is the authentic declaration of the truth. But it is a declaration that emerges out of a uh, Christ who opened not his mouth, says Bart. We always read in the scripture again and again and again that Christ never did respond verbally. So we have a declaration, a self-declaration, which uh, is from a Christ who opened not his mouth. He only speaks, says Bart, through the sign of the cross, through the sigh of the cross, that sigh of, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But Bart says this sigh of the cross is like a sound of many waters. In Revelation 1.5, it's word without audible voice. It is uh, Christ's truth as kerygma, meaning that uh, it possesses miraculous signifying power that points to God. And the church does hear Christ as this uh, rhema voice and logos word, which emerges out of this uh, sigh of abandonment. So we end up with a triad uh, in our first block of word as crucified as that incision of ontological and dynamic importance within the covenant history that we enjoy. And then word as subject is the strange form of humiliation which uh, Christ took on for our salvation, which seeks faithful response. And then those two come together word as crucified and word as subject to create word as conclusion or word as consummation. It's a movement that is silent and concealed, not audible, but uh, spiritually present, and it is moving toward peace. It is moving, moving toward the consummation of Irene peace. So our first triad is going to be word as crucified, subject, and consummation. We'll move on to block two. We're going to take a look at uh, this irrevocable covenant when it becomes incarnate in the horrible depth of God forsakenness. Irrevocable covenant becomes incarnate through Christ as uh, the far country of entering into God forsakenness itself. So we carry over our, carry over our triad of word as crucified, word as subject, word as conclusive peace. But what represents the incarnate word of conclusion? What represents this incarnate word? Well, Bart says it means the old man is expelled and the new man is introduced. And he says there are four aspects of the word as God forsakenness. And first of all, God makes Christ the paschal lamb bearing our sin. That's from John 1.29. So, First, you have the Father making Christ the Paschal Lamb to bear our sins. But the cry of forsakenness in Mark 15.34 must be abbreviated under God's good will. It is always going to be understood through that reflection. So the crying out of Christ is both the death cry of the old man and the birth cry of the new man. And we have an emergence of a uh, triad of this incarnate covenant through Christ as the word of promise, which is internalized as uh, we internalize that word of promise in Christ as the expelled old self and the awakened new self. And the awakened new self is unified with God through Christ's cry of forsakenness. Because Christ suffered forsakenness, the resurrection promises us that none will be forsaken by God. So the cry of forsakenness reaches the declaration of the unification of humanity with God's self. So word and awakening reach the eschatological conclusion of the movement of a dynamic kingdom moving toward Irene peace. So we've got our two uh, little mini triads of uh, the initial structure and the incarnate triad. And let's move on to block three and see how this all reaches eschatological signification.
And in block three, we read that God forsaken us is taken up into the Father himself as a honosis lifting of the passion into God's self. The passion, the crucifixion, the God forsaken us is the revelation of the intrinsic nature of God as love. It's God as agape self-giving. So it is a, a revelation of that which is taken up into God's self. It is actually a lifting up of the passion into God's self. So Axiom 1, it was within God himself that the affliction of the passion was first born within God himself. Christ, the Christ event reveals the fellow suffering of God, which is a strange form to understand God, but it reveals God as a fellow suffering God. Axiom 2, God makes his place with those who are isolated in deepest need. God, through this revelatory Christ event, tells us his place is with the smitten, his place is with the abased, his place is with the rejected, his place is with the outcast, his place is with sinners, humanity entrapped in sin. So our conclusion, therefore, Christ's possibility of speech is always a speech that passes through Gethsemane and Golgotha. Christ speaks his word, his revelatory word, his saving word from forsaken silence, which was his own death and abandonment. It's a forsakenness that has established Irene peace between God and man. Because Christ suffered abandonment, we receive the promise of unification. I know this unification is imprinted with the form of Golgotha. So we are being lifted into unification with God's self, but it's always with a struggling and imprinted salvation history, which is a, a salvation history imprinted with crucifixion, with Golgotha. So we look at uh, 3, note 4. There also must be the, uh, we just looked at the speaking of the word. Now we must hear Christ's word from Gethsemane and Golgotha. Bart says hearing is beyond doctrine, even his doctrine. Doctrine just summons us to hear. He says there are four concepts depicting the rhema voice of Christ. It is a voice out of forsaken silence. That's where Christ speaks. It is a voice of the divine sovereign act of reconciliation. It is a voice of the self-giving, agape self-giving, of the self-disclosure of God through Christ. And it is a mystery that through this work of God, we can receive the grace of fellowship with God through Christ's abandonment and passion. So for seconds. Silence, reconciliation, agape, and mystery. Christ's word as uh, spoken and heard creates, says Bart, a covenant history, and that covenant history is a dialectical covenant history. What does that mean, dialectical? Well, Bart gives it uh, a name, a, a metaphorical name, I like it. He calls it uh, the dialectic of the Holy Spirit striding through our history. It's the dialectic of the Holy Spirit striding through our history. It occurs during the intervening time of promise that we live in now. It's a movement toward consummation, and it's always according to the renewing power of Christ's rhema voice. The rhema voice of Christ renews us and always renews the kingdom in our reality. So spoken word becomes word event as a dialectical operation, says Bart. There's the going out of the word of announcement. There's the revelatory increase of our faith and our knowledge through the church. There's the return of correspondence to God's dox of glory as the historical sequence of word events. So there's your three moments, the going out and announcement, the second moment of a revelatory increase, and the third moment, moment of that phenomenon of the return of correspondence. So just like we discussed earlier, you've got uh, announcement, revelation, phenomenon. That's your triad of dialectical operation.
So we have uh, brilliant, brilliant teaching from Bard here. This, I'm just going to try to reiterate this, and I want you to take this in. This lesson was entirely adopted by Jürgen Moltmann, the successor to Karl Barth, and he did present it in his Theology of Hope, but Ameri American readers misunderstood the Theology of Hope and neglected the imprint of the cross. Moltmann responded by correcting American misinterpretations by writing The Crucified God, which took up the entire volume was dedicated to the concept of God forsakenness. The Crucified God is dedicated to this dedicated lesson by Bart. It's dedicated to the concept of God forsakenness. And so here we have that groundwork that later Moltmann, Jürgen Moltmann picked up, especially with his uh, corrective volume of The Crucified God, to correct the misinterpretations of the Theology of Hope. So we'll pick up next time uh, again in paragraph 70 on page 65.